tell you what, the beautiful people over here, awesome. More beautiful people over here. Fantastic looking people over here. Fabulous. Amazing. Wonderful. I tell you what, it is a good morning in South Carolina, but it's a great morning in Charleston. All right. This morning, our prayer will be led by Reverend McCormick, who will be followed by our, our pledge will be led by General Bed, Bud Watts, former president of the Citadel. Reverend? Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you've uh, gathered us here. We thank you for this country. We thank you for this city. And uh, Lord, we uh, thank you that um, you're not one who judges, but frees us in your mercy and grace to where we don't have to constantly look at ourselves and measure ourselves, but we can look to our neighbor to serve them because we know we belong to you. So give us that confidence today that uh, as we move forward through these talks, that you would inspire our hearts to look to our neighbors and not to ourselves. And uh, knowing that we belong to you alone, so we pray for your blessing on this place in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Are you ready? Gerald. Morning, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you face the flag, place your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God. I tell you what, I just, just flew in from Washington last night, and I will tell you that we had some serious moves this week. A trillion dollar spending package that gave me 2,300 pages of reading in less than 24 hours. I thought there was something about you have to pass it to read it, and I didn't believe it, but now I understand why they say it. But we didn't pass, I didn't go for it because I couldn't find a way to read 2,300 pages in less than 24 hours. But that is what they call regular order in Washington, D.C. Because with our current president, what we have is a real mess on our hands. You know, there, it's nice to see it in the classroom. You know, a good professor in the classroom is a wonderful thing. But when the professor becomes the president of the United States, regular order vanishes. But what we really need is a person who understands how to run a business. What do you think? Executive of a state, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, we are fortunate to have our chief executive of South Carolina with us, Nikki Haley. She's here with us this morning. Yeah. And I know we are looking forward to hearing from Mitt Romney. Don't tell Mitt I said this, but I think Mitt would agree with me. We're really here to see the star of his show, the beautiful, the wonderful Mrs. Romney. <laughs> now you understand why. Mitt actually has more than a chance because he's got good taste. <laughs> Thank you so much and good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Charleston. Um, when I travel around the country, people ask me, what's it like? And I'm like, you know what? It's amazing because you get to see cities you never would see otherwise. And Charleston's one of those that I tell people about because it is one of the most beautiful, charming cities in all of America. So we love coming here. Um, we're here for another reason today, though. Congressman, thank you. Um, we're here, uh, and I think you're all here, because we love America. 
and because we are worried about the future of America. Um, there are some wonderful people running for president, and I happen to think that there's only one that can actually turn around America. And that's why I am so delighted to introduce the next two governors, Governors Haley and Romney. But there is never a time where we are dealing with anything where I can't pick up the phone and call this congressman and know that he's going to be here. So give it up for Congressman Tim Scott. And what I have told everybody is that we have great people in South Carolina. And I've told the Romneys that they are in a state that I dearly love. So help give me a huge warm welcome to Mitt and Ann Romney. Make it loud. husband that puts on a military uniform every day and makes us proud like all our military men and women. The coolest first fella, Michael Haley, is here. Stand up. He hates it when I call him that. <laughs> so first of all, I just want to tell you that we have gone through a process that has been filled with debates and has been filled with candidates, and we've seen a lot happen. And as we have gone through that process, I had to make a decision, and Michael and I had a lot to talk about. And so as we were doing this, I knew that I was going to give an endorsement. But what was important to me was that I wanted to give an endorsement that was important as a governor of a state, what a governor was looking for in a president. And as we went through the process, what I thought about were the families in South Carolina. The number one thing or things that I hear from families in South Carolina that they care about, that is echoed across this country, are jobs, the economy, and spending. Over and over and over again. It's always jobs, the economy, and spending. And so the first thing I thought was, what is the biggest threat to that? And the biggest threat we have seen to that, like no other, has been the chaos, which is Washington, D.C. And so I immediately knew that the leader of, this, of our country could not have any ties to Washington, D.C. We needed to have someone fresh. We needed to have someone that could go in there and leave and not be beholden to Washington, D.C. at all. The second thing I thought about was, it's not, you've heard me say many times, it's not what you say, it's what you do. And I wanted someone that had done it. And Governor Romney was someone who had taken broken businesses and turned them around and made them successful. Took a weekend Olympics 
and turned it around and made it a source of pride for our country. And on top of all of that, he went in and governed a state, cut taxes 19 times, balanced his budget with an 85% Democratic legislature. That's impressive. That's impressive. about was that as governor, the hardest part about my job over and over again has been the federal government. Whether they've dealt with Medicaid, whether they fought us on illegal immigration, whether they fought us on voter ID, over and over again I deal as much with the federal government on a day-to-day -day basis as I do the legislature. And actually the federal government has given me a harder time. And so as I talked to Governor Romney, I asked him the hard questions. I said, tell me, because South Carolina cannot and will not have health care mandates in this state. And I told him I was going to ask him the tough questions, and he said on my very first day, he said, I will give South Carolina a waiver, and I will fight to repeal the health care mandate law that the President has. Every day I fight for jobs. I fight to bring jobs into our state, and I've got a president that's been fighting to get them out. What are you going to do about the National Labor Relations Board? What are you going to do about the unions and what they've done to Boeing? And he said, I will work with the private sector every day. The unions are not going to have be beholden to me, and I'm not going to let them have any more power than they already have. So he Take everything that I've just said to you, and the icing on the cake is that he is the only candidate that President Obama continues to go after time and time yes. again, which tells me he's scared of it. And I like the fact that President Obama is scared of it. Now, we have Congressman Tommy Hartnett, and I want to thank you for your support of Governor Romney. So, thank you very, very much. And then the final straw was that we are a military family. Michael and I know what all of our military families in our state and in our country go through. And it is very important that we have a president that understands you strengthen our military. You don't go and weaken it like what we've seen President Obama do. our men and women in uniform and give them all the backing and the strengthening they need. So it is with that that I humbly, respectfully, and am excited to say that Michael and I absolutely, in every way, support Governor Mitt Romney for President of the United States. over a year ago, I said, if you like what I have to say, go tell 10 people. And you did. And we changed history in South Carolina. Now I'm telling you, if you like what he has to say, go tell 10 people and let's change history in America. Because what I saw, and I endorsed him in 2008, what I saw was a candidate that knew his issues and wanted to win. What I see in 2011, is so much more than a candidate. This is a leader that knows his issues and already knows what he wants to do the first 30 days in office. Give it up for the next president of the United States. Saturday morning. I think Congressman Scott has something to do with that, but I, I'm appreciative of your being here, and uh, 
What a, an endorsement that is. I'll tell you, that brought a smile to my face when I was on the, I was on the elliptical exercising yesterday at about 6 o'clock Iowa time, 6 a.m., and uh, just exercising there, and suddenly on the screen comes your governor, and she endorsed me on the screen there on Fox. On Fox, of course, that's what I was watching. And, uh, and, uh, I've been smiling every moment since, so I'm delighted to be here with Governor Haley this morning, with Michael, and, uh, and with you, and with Congressman Scott. I watched this guy. I saw this guy campaigning. I, I was out campaigning uh, for then Nikki Haley candidate. I guess you were state representative at that point. And, uh, and we did an event together. And this guy, I I'll tell you, he, the place was just jumping by the time he was finished speaking. He's got a powerful voice, an extraordinary capacity to, to energize people. And he's having the same impact in Washington he's had here. People there recognize this as a man of character and conviction who has the ability to persuade people to do the right thing. So I'm delighted that you're here and that you've, hold, you've held a couple of these, as I understand it. What, about six? Seven. Seven. I'm right. number seven. I'm number I'm seven. Number seven. I'm lucky seven. So I'm, thank you so much, Congressman Scott. I appreciate you. your hospitality. Now, I, I'd love to tell you all the reasons why I love this country. And it's a, it's a long list. Um, my mom and dad taught me to love America. They took me around to the national parks, and I, I got to see the beauty of the country. Over the years, I've met Americans all over the, the land, and uh, we're an extraordinary people. We have great passion for our country and for the values upon which our country was founded. But there's something unique in this country that, uh, that has led us to become not just a, a land that I love and a people that I admire and respect, but we've also been extraordinarily generous to the world prosperous ourselves, and, uh, and a people that are, that are kind and, and good. And, and I wonder, why is it that, for instance, the income per person in America, for the average American, is about a third higher than for people in, in Europe, let's say? What, what drove that to happen? And it's not our DNA is different, because our, you know, we're a mixture of people from all over the world, so our, our DNA is about the same. There's something else that accounts for that difference. I happen to believe it's the principles and values upon which this country has been based. And th those values and <laughs> principles drove us to outcompete the Europeans from which many of us sprung and, and continue to outcompete the more populous nations of Asia. What were those, those principles? What were they? One, when the founders came together and, and drafted those first documents, they recognized that our rights were not given to us by government, but by God. We were endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That last phrase, sometimes we sort of brush over. We shouldn't. It was a recognition on the part of the founders that in America, people would be able to pursue their, in their course in life as they chose. Government wouldn't tell us what to do. The circumstance of birth would not prevent us from achieving our great dreams. Instead, we can pursue happiness as we chose. And, and that freedom, the freedom of opportunity, political freedom, economic freedom, personal freedom, those freedoms combined drew people here from all over the world. Those seeking opportunity, those with big dreams, came here, were their descendants. Many of us are. Some came here involuntarily and had to become champions to overcome the challenges they faced in coming here. It's an extraordinary people we have here because of the freedoms and the champions of the American people. Now today I recognize the power of a society based on opportunity or merit. In this country, a merit-based society, people who do their best to get as much education as they can, as they can afford and, and, and willing to, to sacrifice for, those who are also willing to work hard and those who are willing to take risks of various kinds and, and then put themselves on the line. Those individuals have the potential to earn great rewards and in doing so, they don't impoverish anybody else. They in fact help lift the entire society. It's an amazing thing. This nation has become so economically successful in part because we're a merit society, an opportunity-based nation. I'm concerned that President Obama and people around him don't understand America, don't understand an opportunity America, don't understand the power of merit.
respects, I think the president wants to transform America from an opportunity nation, from a merit society to an entitlement society. Where, where the, the, their view is that, that the government should take from some to give to others so that we're all more equal. And, and uh, the challenge with that is, of course, that we'll also be more poor. Because any nation that's tried to take from some to give to others and has that as the goal of the governmental enterprise finds itself becoming poorer and poorer, whether that was the former Soviet Union or Cuba today or North Korea. It just doesn't work. It's not the way that America has led the world. And the people of America are going to reject Obamaism and maintain the opportunity nation we have always been. Let me just mention them and then turn to your questions. One is that I think, for some reason I find hard to understand, this president is intent on spending massively more than we take in. I think it is immoral for us to continue to spend our kids' future. To keep spending more than we take in is simply wrong. We can't <laughs> and finally, the president seems to have one place he's willing to cut dramatically, and that's the military. And, and I mean, you, you know we cut about $350 billion out of the 10-year uh, forecast for our military, then, then it's added out of that about a $650 billion additional cut, and uh, his Secretary of Defense, by the way, called that a doomsday scenario, if those additional uh, uh, cuts go in place. I, I hope you understand what's already happened to our military. The, the Navy was asked how many ships it needed to maintain its missions. They said a minimum number of 313 ships were down at about 284 and headed towards the low, towards the low 200s. Our Air Force, by the way, is older and smaller than at any time since 1947 when it was founded. The, the administration is planning on cutting 50,000 active duty personnel from our military force. I, I don't think the world is a safer place to justify those kind of cuts. In my view, it's essential for us to increase the capacity of our Navy. I would go from nine ships a year to 15. I would improve the modernization, bring the modernization of our Air Force up to speed. <laughs> Instead of subtracting 50,000 active duty personnel, I'd like to add 100,000 active duty personnel. And, uh, and you might say, well, how are you going to pay for all that? What's going to make that? There's an active duty personnel mom right there. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no. and, uh, and, and, and people say, but isn't how you pay for all that? And, and the answer is there's a lot of waste in the Department of Defense. And, and I'm going to go after that waste. But instead of using it to pay for social programs, I'm going to make sure we use that to rebuild our Navy, to rebuild our Air Force, to keep our troops. Make sure we give our veterans the care they deserve. <laughs> so I intend to bring America back to the principles that made us great in the beginning. We'll keep America strong, we'll keep it safe, we'll keep America prosperous. For ourselves, for the many, many Americans suffering today by virtue of the policies of this administration, and for our kids and our grandkids. And keep America as it's always been, the shining city on a hill. Thank you so much. The way, the way we do Tim's Town Hall is very simple. You ask the questions, I deliver it to our next, possibly next president of the United States. You had it right there. <laughs> I like the way you think, that's it. <laughs> And then he'll answer it. So we'll get right to it. And sometimes the questions come from Facebook. Our first question is from Facebook. They may be in the audience as well. Ray Honeycutt. There he is right here. I'm going to help. Yeah. Mr. Honeycutt is a very intelligent young man because he has, he has a great question for you, man. How are you going to prevent his generation from having to pay for the government's outrageous debt? Well, 
first of all, you've listened to politicians for uh, I don't know how many years talk about how they're going to cut the budget and uh, rein in the deficits, and every year the deficits seem to get bigger and the debt gets larger. The accumulated deficits of our country have now totaled about $15 trillion. It's a number that most of us can't comprehend. I sure can't get my mind around a trillion dollars or $15 trillion. This president has added almost as much debt, or will by the end of his first term, uh, his only term. Uh, he will... Uh, <laughs> He will have added about uh, as much debt as all the prior presidents combined. So if we have another four years after that, you can expect a, a, another, well, it won't be a doubling, but you can see another 100% added to the debt. And uh, that's just unacceptable. And so here's what I do, Mr. Honeycutt. I missed your first name. What was it? Raymond. Raymond? Ray? Raymond. Raymond. All right, Raymond. Here's, uh, here's what I do. I would come into office and I would take federal spending from one quarter of our economy today, 25% of the GDP. I take it from 25% down to 20%, all right? I'm gonna bring it down. I have to cut $500 billion out of the budget. And how do I do that? One, I get rid of some programs we don't need. Now there's some programs I like, but we just can't afford. And for me, the test is this. Is this program so critical, so essential, that we should uh, borrow money from China to pay for it. That's a pretty high test. And so things I, I like, like the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities and, uh, uh, and PBS not having to have advertising, I'm going to change that and say, look, we're not going to keep spending that money. And, and then there's some things I don't like I can get rid of. Number one is Obamacare. That's... Uh, <laughs> There are some programs that the federal government runs that they don't run very well. And, uh, and there's all sorts of fraud and abuse that goes on. And I'm going to take those programs, and one of them is called Medicaid. It's a health care program for, for the poor. And instead of having the federal government run it and tell states what they have to do with the money, I'm going to take that money, give it back to the states, and say, you run these programs for your own poor in the way you think best. got a long list like that, Governor. You're going to be happy. Do, do you, I, I, was, uh, I understand, by the way, this is interesting. You see, when you get elected to office, some politicians think that they can only be popular if they, uh, if they come up with new programs. And they want to tell their constituents, I, I passed this bill, I started this new program. Then there are all these people in Washington who have to run the program. They hire people to oversee it and run it and tell the states what to do. And you end up with all this bureaucracy and the money that gets to the people ends up being the, the drop at the end of the, of the pipe. You know how many workforce training programs we have in America? These are programs to help people get new work skills if they lose jobs. You know how many different programs? 47 different programs. All sorts of money and overhead. They report to eight different government agencies, these different programs. I want to take all that money and take that and give it back to the states and say, you guys run your own program in the way you think best for your people. Doing that, doing that, saves about $100 billion a year. And then finally, I'm gonna take the remaining government employees and cut that number by 10%. And, and I'm gonna link the pay of people who work in government with that for people who work in the private sector. I don't think that's going to happen. Obviously, Tim's going to do it. So I want to say thank you to you for a question that really gave me a chance to lay out how I'm going to make sure we balance our budget, rein in spending, and promise the next generation this will continue to be the economic powerhouse of the world. You've got a bright future, young man. I wish I were your age. I must say, that was not a sound bite, and that's a good thing. <laughs> you know what we're talking about. And we need someone in Washington that really understands the issues and not just the talking points on the issues. But you did mention pipelines. 
question comes from working on my sound bites. Tom O'Neill. Is Tom O'Neill here? Tom, as a you, sir. Tom's question has to do with telling the president that by not supporting the Keystone Pipeline, he's actually costing 20,000 union jobs, and it creates a great divide between public unions and private unions. He'd like to hear your response. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Um, you know, uh, the unions in the private sector were created to, in many cases, improve people's job skills and to, and to balance employers that uh, have become abusive, and, and unions can play an important role in our society. Um, our president seems to be drawn towards the, the unions that make big contributions to his campaigns. I don't think that it's fair for people to have dues taken out of their salary, out of their wages, to go to a union boss who then gets to decide which candidate he's going to support. I don't think that's fair. But as to the pipeline, how in the world can anyone justify saying to Canada, we don't want that pipeline coming here. We know that it's important for you to be able to make process or progress rather. And, and, and provide for your own finances. And so we know that if, if we stall long enough, why you won't have the opportunity to bring a pipeline to America. Instead, you'll build a pipeline for China. It's, and, and so this president, bowing to the special interests in his party, the most extreme environmentalists, I mean the 1% the of environmentalists in this country, think that's a great idea. Uh, he, he is saying we're gonna stall on this pipeline. We need the oil, we need the gas. America and North America are energy rich. He's treating us like we're energy poor. It's time to have a president who will develop our resources in this country and get us off the floor. Of We've just received something of a news flash that the Senate has just voted 89 to 10 to extend the payroll tax for two months. Two months. Now, I'm not sure what short-term economics means in Washington, but can you talk to us for a few minutes about the payroll tax, the unemployment insurance, and the Senate's inability to work in this universe, not the alternate universe? Well, you know, it, it's hard to expect a bunch of uh, kitty cats to all come together and march in lockstep. All right, that's just not gonna happen. And so the only way you can hurt cats, difficult as it is, is to have a leader, is to have somebody who knows how to bring people together and find some common ground, maybe some catnip, I'm not sure what you have to do. And uh, I, I had the occasion, I, I considered it the misfortune when, when I was running for office and then got elected as the governor of Massachusetts to be elected in a state where my legislature was 85% Democrat. But you know what? It turned out to be good fortune in some respects. Because I learned how to find people across the aisle that shared some principles, that we could find some common ground. I learned how to be respectful from, for people who have different views of myself and to find a way to lead in a setting where not everybody is in your same party. And this president has been unable to do that. I think it's in part because he's never had the opportunity to lead before. He didn't lead in the, in the Illinois Senate. He didn't lead in the U.S. Senate, so he's taking his first run at leadership in the White House. It's not a place for on-the-job training. And, um, and so I look at what's happening with these, these, uh, these stopgap measures, two-month extension. Look, I don't want to raise taxes on people in America. Uh, I didn't want to see our taxes go up. I also don't want to see that pipeline from China closed off. I want that to be opened up. I think the Republicans came up with a pretty good idea of combining those two and saying, okay, let's, let's do both of these good things. Let's do them together and get it done. And, and why in the world this president's having such a difficult time actually leading may be the result of the fact that he's constantly demonizing and attacking. He, he ran as a president who was going to bring us all together. Remember that? And over the last three years, all he's done is attack one group after the other inside this country. It seems to be his his normal pattern, attack Americans, attack Americans, divide Americans. That is not the American way to success and greatness. And I hope that we finally have a president who's able to sit down with good Democrats who love America and great Republicans who love America, find common ground and get America strong again. I intend to be that kind of leader. Thank you. Kathy Perry. Kathy, thank you for 
question. Kathy has a question about what would be the first thing that you do to secure our borders? Well, there are a couple of things. Let me tell you how we do it. First, I want to build a fence. All right, I, I want to have a fence in place. And I, want to have, and I want to have enough border patrol agents so they can secure the fence. And then, uh, and then I want to crack down on employers that hire people in this country that they know are here illegally. All right, so and how do I do that? Because the employers say, well, I don't know who's here legally and illegally. Well, I'm going to help you. I I'm going to give those who come legally a card that identifies them as being here legally. And when someone wants to hire someone who doesn't have a valid social security number, they take the card, they swipe it through their computer and just type in the number. It instantly tells them whether that's a valid number or, or a fraudulent number. And if they, uh, if they don't do that, if they don't check their identification, don't get that government approval that the card is acceptable, and they hire them anyway, they're going to get severely punished. Just like companies do that don't pay their taxes with severe punishment. You do that, and the only people who will be able to find work in this country are citizens and people who come here legally. You do those things. Denver Merrill. Oh, there you go. Wait. Is that you did it? I want to see your ID. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never understand. I can't, I can't see it, but I can hear him back there. Yeah. I assume he's there. Okay. Yeah. Right. There he is. Okay. Denver has a very important question. You know, Charleston is a port town. And Denver's question is what is your vision for improving our infrastructure system? Uh, we, we've, got, we've got infrastructure issues in our ports on our rail yards, on our aircraft systems, in our highways in particular. I came in as the, the governor of my state. I, I, I won't speak for Governor Haley here, but I came in and my transportation people said that we had 550 structurally deficient bridges in my state. 550. And we were spending $100 million a year on bridge repairs. I doubled that to $200 million a year. Now that means I had to cut some other things to make sure that we were able to put priority behind getting our bridges up to, up to speed. We're going to have to make an investment in our infrastructure. And, uh, and that's a place where if we make that investment, it will pay a return. I, I, uh, I don't mind borrowing if something has a revenue stream that will pay back the borrowing. What I don't like is what we see in Washington, where we borrow from just everyday expenses with no new revenue stream to pay it back. But for instance, with regards to ports, as, the, as ports are dredged and made deep water ports and made more competitive, they're, they're then able to have more produce come into them, more product come into them. They can charge, therefore, on the product coming in and can pay back the cost of the dredging or improvements. That's, that's what's going to have to happen in our ports, in our, on our highways, uh, in, our, in our aircraft system. We, we're going to have to make the investment to upgrade our infrastructure to make it competitive globally, but also so that our enterprises can be successful in moving products around, and then we can be competitive selling products around the world. I, I, I recognize that America has to compete. And for us to compete and have, have good jobs, we need to have good infrastructure. And I'll stand behind, by the way, the decision as to which ports to, to dredge and which, uh, which rail lines to improve and which highways to get uh, upgraded. That's a decision that should be based upon analysis of need <coughs> And, and a potential for return and opportunity, not based upon politics. You got to get politics. Yates Wilburn. Yates, thank you for your question. What is your opinion on a federal right to work law? Well, if one came to my desk, I'd be happy to sign it. Um, I think the uh, the. Uh, Right now, of course, the states, the 22 states that have right-to-work legislation have a big advantage, right? It's working very well uh, for South Carolina and some other states who brought in some, uh, some great enterprises. Uh, what is it Michelin Tire you have and, and uh, BMW and who else you got? Boeing. Oh, I know Boeing, of course. Right? <laughs> That's kind of famous, yeah. And, uh, uh, and so by virtue of the advantage you have, there's some states that are not right-to-work states, that are union states that, that are looking and seeing jobs uh, going where they'd like to have them and saying, wow, you know, and, and that's going to put pressure state by state. The, the course I would take if I were president is to encourage states to adopt right to work legislation. I, I believe in the Tenth Amendment. I want states to do that one by one, craft their own uh, approaches to, to labor regulation. But um, the, 
the right course look for America is to say that, that if unions can compete, and many unions can. I, you know, I, I toured the Carpenter Union facility. <laughs> they do some great, great work training their people. They can be highly competitive. Unions work fine if they're in competition. And, uh, but, but where the law says that only unions can compete, that, that in my view is a mistake. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of right to work legislation. Thank you. Can I understand that you're going to Myrtle Beach this, this afternoon? Fun in the sun. <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to interview in a few minutes as well after this is over as well. So you're, you've got a very tight schedule. So we have about 10 more minutes to answer questions. And so what we're going to go is to a rapid fire round. Oh. So I just made that up. It sounds real good. I so say, we'll figure out how it works. It's, it's not, except rapid fire. It's not, if you're the guy being fired at, I don't know if it's not so you got to point this. Yeah. Mostella? Only first Mostella up here. Okay. Mostella. Thank you, man. Oh, there she is back there. Hi. What is your position on Social Security and its reform is my addition to her question. It's yeah. reform. Well, Social Security plays a very important role in our country. It's a safety net uh, for seniors and also for disabled. And, and we have seen an unusual thing over the years. The, the people in Washington have taken the money that's gone into Social Security, the excess, and they spend it every year. And, uh, and so we, we recognize we face a, a financial future in Social Security that's, uh, well, John McCain used to say it's bankrupt. Uh, it's not bankrupt yet. Uh, for seniors that are currently on the system and those coming along, they're just fine. But for young people, who uh, like sitting next to Sidney Costa here, uh, Social Security is going to be a real problem for him unless we make the system sustainable. Make it not just fine for those of us that are getting older, but also for those that are quite young. And so there are a couple of, of changes that I think are going to have to be made to make sure that Social Security is there forever. One is to say that for higher income individuals, like myself, higher income individuals, that the Social Security benefits won't grow at a real high rate, but grow at a little slower rate. I'd use the CPI, for instance, as opposed to the wage index, which is higher. And secondly, we probably ought to, over time, increase the retirement age a year or two. If you do those two things, we don't have to raise taxes, we don't have to look at a future with massive deficits that we can't fund. Those changes to Social Security make sure that it stays sustainable, that it provides for current seniors, and it also provides for future seniors. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very glad that the rapid fire round are only simple questions. <laughs> Stefan Castellucci. There he is. Hi, Stefan. After the repeal of Obamacare, how would you reform health care? Oh, good. Yeah, that's a simple question. Yeah. Let, let me tell you uh, how many things do I have time for in a rapid fire? One. One, I would return to the states the authority and responsibility they had prior to Obamacare. And that is states are responsible for care of their own uninsured and their own poor. And the Medicaid dollars I mentioned before, I'd give back to the states so they have the funds to do that. That's number one. Number two, I would end the discrimination, I call it, that exists between an individual sole proprietor in a business, for instance, or an individual that wants to buy insurance and a big company. If a big company wants to buy insurance for you, and you say, yeah, get me this Blue Cross plan, for instance, they get a tax deduction as they buy it for you. But if you decide you want to buy it for yourself, you don't have that deduction. You pay in pre-tax dollars. I want to eliminate that discrimination between individuals. <laughs> I got a longer list, but I'll stop with it. As George Costanza said, when they applaud, just stop at that there point. <laughs> Bill Stevens. There he is. Bill. Bill. Bill, his question is, long story short, President Obama keeps talking, saying nothing, and he wants to know about the fact that 47% of Americans pay no taxes. Now, now, How is that fair? Yeah, 47% of Americans pay no income tax. And um, i, I, I got to tell you, I, I think people in this country want to feel they're helping to contribute to our military, to our defense. Uh, they want to feel that they're contributing to our roads and highways, they're contributing to, to America. And uh, I don't want to raise taxes on people, That's, and particularly on people that are uh, feeling tough times. 
But what I would want, it, I would sure want to find some way to let every American feel that they're contributing to the security and defense of this great land. I'll, I'll look for a way to do that. Thank you. Elaine? There you are. I like that Christmas outfit here. That's uh, very nicely done. That's a big, extraordinarily strong husband. Thank you. <laughs> All muscle, right? All muscle. Leave them alone. So. Prior to Jimmy Carter, the Department of Education, what would you do about transforming education? I think every Republican you see is going to say, we, we've got to, got to get schools so that they're run at the local and, and state level. The federal government shouldn't be running schools and, and dictating policies to, to states and localities. And we all agree on that. And, uh, and that's certainly the direction I would take if I were President of the United States. At the same time, I want you to know that I applauded something President George W. Bush did. He, he said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take uh, something called No Child Left Behind as a vehicle to hold off the federal teachers unions. Because the federal teachers unions have so much power that some localities and states have a hard time standing up to them. And he said, look, I want states to be able to test their kids to see which schools are succeeding and which are failing. Now, the bill isn't perfect. There are things in it I'd change and, and, make, uh, and make, I think, more fair. But I do think that there is a role for now for the federal government and for the president to stand up to teachers' unions to make sure we get more school choice, we have more opportunities for parents, we, we are able to measure the succeeding and the failing schools, and we say it's time to put the kids first and the unions behind. Kyle Bergman. Kyle, thank you. Good question for Kyle. What is your stance on waterboarding? Uh, what is my stance on waterboarding? Um, I, I am not, if I'm President of the United States, not going to define uh, for our enemies around the world exactly what in, enhanced interrogation techniques we're going to use. I'm not going to give them a list. Of this tell you that I will do what I believe, if I'm president, I'll do what I believe is essential to protect the lives of the people of America, and I will not participate, I will not authorize torture, uh, but I'm not going to give them that list. I'm going to do what's right, and people are going to have to have confidence that the person they elect is a person of uh, sobriety, capacity, judgment, and wisdom. I hope I pass that test in your mind, and if I do, I'll do what's necessary to protect this country within the law. Robert Elbert. Right there. Hi, Robert. What's your last name? Egbert. Egbert. Not Elbert. Egbert. Robert. He's not so concerned about your foreign policy. He wants to know about how you're going to scale down the military or build it up. And he references Ron Paul's stance. Yeah. Um, Ron Paul and I agree on some things and disagree on others. Foreign policy is a place we disagree. I, I happen to believe. That, uh, that the reason we were attacked on 9-11 uh, had to do with the, the view of some, Al-Qaeda uh, Al and other jihadists, uh, that somehow there's a desire on their part to, to bring down the rest of the world, to cause the collapse of America and our friends around the world, and they attacked us in an unprovoked way. They declared war on us, and, and they will continue to fight us, and therefore that we must remain strong militarily. I believe that there are also other nations that intend to get stronger and that at some point would consider testing us, either here or somewhere abroad. I think the best, the best ally peace has is a strong America. And I want to... Uh, we're going to see our total military spending come down as we get out of Afghanistan and Iraq. But there are some that would take our base Department of Defense budget and keep on cutting it, bring it down, down, down. We spend, it's about 3.8% of our economy we spend on, on the Department of Defense, 3.8%. I told you that the total federal spending is 25%. This is 3.8% we spend in defending ourselves on our, on our base uh, Department of Defense budget. 
And, uh, and there's some who want to keep bringing that down, 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 down. I'm not one of those. Uh, I, I believe that as we find efficiencies and cut out waste, we should, again, rebuild our Navy, rebuild our Air Force, uh, make sure that we have additional uh, uh, active duty personnel, that we have the funds to care for our veterans properly. And, and my view, I, I had a, a, a meeting, I guess it's now a few months ago, I was in Great Britain and met with uh, former Prime Minister Tony Blair and the current Prime Minister David Cameron and other governmental leaders there. And one of them said this, it's, uh, it's something with which I agree. He said, Mitt, if you're lucky enough to become president, you will undoubtedly travel around to different capitals of the world and they will rehearse for you some of America's mistakes and failings. And he said, but don't ever forget this. What we all fear the most is a weak America. American strength is essential for us and for the world. I want to have a military that's so strong, no one would ever think of testing it. The best way to keep the world is Last question that will lead you into your wrap up from my mom, Francis Scott. <laughs> my mother wants to know why should we vote for you to be the next president of the United States? Thanks, Mom. <laughs> well, one, I can win. All right. I can win. Number one is because I have the best uh, wife in the world, but that's not the <laughs> But also, I have spent my life, 25 years of it, in the private sector, and then in the voluntary sector at the Olympics, and then as the governor of a state. Those years in the private sector helped me understand how the economy works. I've learned from successes and failures, and that kind of experience is what Americans are looking for because the economy as the governor just mentioned, is the issue that's number one in people's minds. And so in debating Barack Obama, posting up against him, he'll talk about academic policies and, and ivory tower ideas, and I'll talk about what really works. And that will give me an edge in those debates and make sure that I get elected. Number two, I'll do the job that America needs. I have proven, not just by my words, again going back to what Governor Haley said, but by what I have done, that I know how to bring fundamental, important, positive change to various settings, businesses, I've run two businesses, both did well. I ran the Olympics, they were in trouble, turned it around with the help of a lot of other good people, and that did well, and our state did well during my tenure. You don't do that, by the way, by having all the only good ideas yourself or by, uh, by thinking that you know uh, everything. Instead, you know how to bring together a team of extraordinary people. That's what great leaders do. I've had the experience of leadership. I will use that experience and the vision we share for what makes America great, to do the things that are essential. One, get this economy going. Two, rein in the scale of the federal government and get it out of our hair. And three, protect our nation by having a strong military. Those are the things I'll do. And I, uh, I... I didn't want to repeat that last thing you just said. I'm just going to say, I need your vote. I, uh, I, uh, I, I want to watch it. Get out there. Let's hear it for, as he says, and perhaps I may agree, the next president of the United States.